Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, College of Complexes. This is a weekly free speech forum where we have uh, various and uh, various and accomplished speakers speaking since 1951. The college is a place where we have weekly free speech forum, and uh, there are some various and sundry parts to this uh, college. The first is where our speaker presents for a brief period of time up, upwards to an hour, and we have our question and answer period, and then right at the end is our infamous rebuttal period. Uh, tonight's speaker uh, will be introduced. Our speaker tonight is uh, author Sue Snell, and uh, I'd like to now uh, have Brown come in and present as our moderator tonight. Without further ado, we will hear from the, the author of the Simplicity Revolution, who is daring to come to this <laughs> college of complexes. Uh, and, and they vow I didn't have to announce it. About to simplify us all. Oh, dear. It's very revolutionary. Good evening. Good evening. And I wanted to thank Charles for inviting me to be a speaker here. And this is my first time at the university, the college. <laughs> college, or can I go university? Isn't it? College. It's a college. It's a college. It's a college. Okay. Okay. We are modest. You're modest. <laughs> yes, yes. We don't. And we are also crazy. So no. <laughs> and you don't wallow in your intelligence. Yes, right. right. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Unlike some universities, I know I live in Evanston, so you know who I mean if I say that. <laughs> So, um, and I, being born and raised in Chicago, it's, it's a stretch sometimes, let me tell you. Um, I just wanted to say it. I'm so happy to be here. And I can tell you all have finished your holiday shopping by now, because you're here, right? Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I mean, in a way, believe me, I, I hate, there's nothing worse than being like I think of a shopping mall. I mean, I can see shopping in the Chicago. I love the small stores, but I don't like shopping malls, like a old orchard type of deal. But they give me the creeps. Um, anyway, um, I, I wanted to tell you that I'm going to talk about some things, and hopefully it's going to be thought-provoking for you all. And by simplicity, I do not mean frugality. I just want you to know, don't equate that with frugality. It's not a book about how you can cut, you, you know, you know. there's really simplicity um, websites where they all they're going to talk to you is about frugality. And that is not what I meant. Because for me, um, by finding simplicity in your life, it's about finding an authentic lifestyle, an authentic life for yourself. And, um, you know, and I, I know myself even writing this book and researching it, um, I should first tell you my background was as a journalist. And then I know that um, Brown mentioned that I was, um, I worked for Governor Thompson. I worked in government for quite a while and saw the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and in fact, you scared me when you said about greasing the palm, you know, being in the horse racing business. I was like, oh, wait a minute. You don't talk like that. You don't talk like that. You know? um, and you were teasing me from. And so um, I, I just want to say that from there, you know, I, I went on to work in various businesses. And um, one of them was I was with Peapod when we took that corporation public. And um, and I really got to see the ugly side of things because on the inside I knew that there was no way this company was going to be able to make money. Yes. And yet we were able to raise seventy-two million dollars on Wall Street in one morning. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, people owners toasting champagne and stuff, and then you know sitting there and knowing that the cash burn in the company back then was, a, you know, a lot. Now I'm speaking of them. They're not owned by. They're not no longer a public corporation. Mm -hmm. They were bought out out of their misery. But a big, uh, I think, believe it's uh, is it Belgium? Mm -hmm. Apple? Abel? Is that Belgium? I can't remember now. But 
um, they bought them as a tax write-off because it's a huge grocery company and out of Europe. And so they use UCB pods still on the road, but that's what, okay. So nothing about that experience was very simple. And it started, you know, you know, absorbing. I was absorbing a lot of stuff, and um, as well as I'm a, I read a lot, and I could just feel this tidal wave coming over the country when in 2008 we had the Lehman Brothers failure. Mm -hmm. And you probably all remember that because that's when we had a huge crashes everywhere. And we also, as consumers, you know, you, me, probably everyone in this room, we started, whoa, wait a minute, and looking at the, your maybe personal debt. I know we did. And, you know, and also we have found a lot of people who have been using their homes as ATMs. And, um, so this all came crashing down. And so I was thinking, why isn't the media talking about people are just into this super size everything lifestyle. They have to have every consumer goods that they can purchase. And why don't people start thinking about downsizing their lifestyle more and getting to back to basics? The other thing was that I'm an antiquer. I've always been into antiques. I had an antique business for a while. And so I would shop at all of these different resale stores. And um, I walked in tonight wearing a beautiful leather jacket. I bought at a resale store for $28, okay? And I can tell you, the, the buys you can find there in these stores is, are incredible. And I only mention that because I also, what kind of got me to write this book, I felt that we have become, I know myself, with this very disposable mentality. It's like, you know, you think about, and I mentioned this in the book, a flashlight. Well, in the old days, I remember my family, we had a flashlight. It seemed to last it forever, you know. And you just replaced the battery, and they kept working. Nowadays, your flashlight doesn't work anymore. It's like you put batteries, it doesn't seem to work anymore. Let's just throw it out and get a new one. Because you think it's going to be cheaper. It's just buy a new one. And that's what's happened in our country. And of course, we're buying our things from China, which everything, we think it's so inexpensive. You walk into Walmart and things are so cheap. And yet that kind of cheapness makes us just hoard more stuff. And we just bring more and more stuff into our lives. And eventually it starts weighing you down and becoming a burden. And um, I know I started, like I said, researching how to, to, what my idea was. And I really was baffled. Why was there no media kind of talking about how this nation needed to kind of start getting back to basics? And um, I wrote this book as a wake-up call because I really talk about our overconsumption and how unsustainable our lifestyles have become. And that bothered me because I also started really doing a lot more, a lot more research on environmental issues. And I was, I was getting very, very, I put on my old reporter's research hat. I, I was consumed with this. I just got shocked what I was finding. And um, it was, uh, you know, this climate change thing that got so debated for so long. Um, I know myself, I have a health condition that I'm very affected by the climate change. And in the hot, hot weather, I have to live in the air conditioning. And so, I mean, I mean, and that's a person. Now, you can only imagine how our nature has been affected by this. And a lot of times people don't think about that, but what they're seeing is, there are certain species that lived at certain mountain levels that have to keep going up looking for, you know, cooler air. Mm -hmm. And they weren't meant, they weren't built to live at that level, but they're going to be evolving. We'll see that over the next course of probably 25 years. But of course, that's after there's many deaths of species. We're going to lose a lot of different species. And you don't hear a lot about that in the news. It's not popular. And, and in our seas, it's even worse. Um, and that, a lot of that comes from the runoff we've allowed into our river systems and our Great Lakes. All I will say to anyone in the room is, 
if you're a fish eater, please think about the fish you eat and think about eating. I mean, many of you are probably fishermen. And I mean, everyone, if you lived on the Great Lakes, you, you grew up with that. You could think about fishing, but the Great Lakes are especially polluted. The fish in the, the lakes, which that's just, that's just very bothersome to me personally. And I'm sure many of you actually. But, um, um, so I just wanted to get back to, you know, after the debt implosion, that's what I call it. Um, the Wall Street fall off and um, a lot of the Wall Street jobs collapsing. Um, it, it just appears now that we're back to our old habits because the debt in this country really, people started taking much more thought before they would just pull out, whip out their credit cards for everything and run off their credit card debt. Of course, those uh, credit card announcements of their constantly raising their rates probably had something to do with that. But, you know, lo and behold, now the Federal Reserve announced that in October, well, we're, we're getting it back up again, you know, so people are once again using their credit cards. Good for the economy, maybe not so good for us as individuals sometimes, but it does understand we're a consumer, um, you know, society. And so it's good for the uh, American um, economy. Um, just was going to tell you that um, where was it? See, Brown, you're not the only one who has those brain fade outs, right? It's a senior moment. I have uh, that. I have many, many. Um, I should have started this with um, introduction. I, I use a lot of quotes for every chapter because for me, it always sets me off to thinking. There, and so when I started researching the simplicity concept, oh my gosh, I realized, you know, since Socrates, man has really, really placed value on this concept of simplicity. And um, first and foremost always was a mentor of mine. He doesn't know because he's been long gone, but um, was Thoreau. As a high schooler, I read his book, as many of us did, Walden Pond. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, hmm, there seems to be something here. I'm not quite sure what it is at that time, you know, but as Ron left the life, and if you reread it, you will really see kind of the concept. If he could feel the pressure of society back, what, 18, uh, 50, 60s, you know, you know, I mean, what are we living in now? You know, we're living in a boiler, you know? So, um, I, anyway, the quote I was going to read to you was somebody who I had a privilege to interview when I was in college. I worked for the newspaper. <clears throat> and that is Margaret Mead. And when I found her quote here, I just felt her presence, and I love the quote so much. And I'm a political activist, and I'll just announce I'm a Democrat. So, but I love Republicans. They're good people, too. They're good people, too, right? You know? No, you're wrong. No, I gotta, I gotta say that. I mean, I don't know. No, 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 no. We, we can all get along, right? There's room for all of us. Oh, there has to be, because we're all on the same planet, you know? Yeah, burning it. Well, that's true. I'm a, listen, I believe me, I agree with that. But um, what I was going to say, Margaret Mead said, I still believe this. Never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed people can make change possible. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Isn't that a wonderful quote? Doesn't that just inspire you? Or maybe I should I read it again? <laughs> if you're not inspired, maybe I should read it again. I mean, I'm not Margaret Mead, so obviously, but I mean, I don't know how she would have phrased it exactly, but I would just say she was an impressive woman, and you know, at the time, I just remember I was nervous as heck and felt so unworthy to be in her presence. She made me feel completely at ease and was wonderful herself. So, you know, okay. Never doubt that a small group of committed, thoughtful people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And so, I, I know myself, um, 
working on many different campaigns over time. Um, you know, you get to this point where you think, oh, man, I'm carrying the load for everyone else. Where are they? You know, and um, and yet you have to be have that commitment and be thoughtful about that commitment. And if you are, then you get that verb and vigor to carry forward, and and you can move mountains. So um, anyway, I, I just like to say that um, I'll read to you. Yeah, I was going to say, and you know, when I say simplicity, I said about the uh, frugality, and I don't even get me started about Congress, <laughs> you know, because that is something that they could use some preaching on how to get a little simpler, don't you? You know, such BS. Excuse my language. Oh, we say bullshit here. Okay, bullshit. <laughs> Congress, clean it up. Clean up your bullshit, right? Gangsters. <laughs> Yeah, what the hell's going on? It makes me sick. Makes me sick. Um, and I have friends there, so I mean, and I would say, I say, they say it to me. So, you know, I mean, they're not happy. They're not happy, a lot of them, with, with how things are going at all. At all. So, um, now I'm just going to read for you um, a few things I have in the book that you might be, a, might, well, I would think would be an interest to this group, definitely, I hope. Um, and that is, I talk about the uh, corporatocracy that um, I really believe that it caused the kind of the crack in our society um, um, in that boom and bust decade that we lived through. And I think you all know, I don't know if many of you lost jobs, but many in our country did and went through some of the most painful times. And, and in preparing to do this book and the research, that was very painful, reading the first-hand accounts of all the people from what they had, were going through. And, um, and, you know, and I would feel each of their, of course I could not feel their, exactly their pain. But I felt some of their pain, and I just had to always fight to realize, you know, I can't wear this. I gotta, gotta shake it off and just, you know, like they do, like they did. And for the most part, everybody just keeps going because, you know, that's just uh, we. Uh, oh, well, so you know, some people like to say, "Well, we're Americans. That's how we do it." Well, no, that's how people do it, not just Americans. So, um, you know, I talk about a lot how. How did this country get so fractured? Because I really felt like that the foundation to our country had cracked. And we, as a society, needed to really start looking at where those cracks were and how can we fix things. And a lot of that comes, as, as we all know, when you look at the big money and the corporate the, I was going to say the Republican side of the, the aisle, but um, which is true. That is correct. And so, I mean, this has really, you know, served as um, like a, a very, very um, upsetting time. Because uh, when I was um, looking for the one quote, I have things so many highlighted, I shouldn't. Um, I've highlighted so much in my own book, huh? <coughs> like here's another quote from John Kennedy, which I loved. I thought, how apropos to this times we've been living in. Those who make peaceful revolutions yeah. impossible will make violent revolutions inevitable. Mm. And that is why I actually went on to name this a revolution. And believe me, I, I did a lot of pondering, oh, wait, that sounds so strong. Maybe it should just be a, a simplicity movement, right? That sounds so, you know, just slide in there, you know? And then, you know, reading John Kennedy's quote, you no, know, you know what? When I researched what causes revolutions, it's whenever you have a protracted economic decline in a society. That is what we are going through. And um, and I think that you know we're a little bit we're getting things are getting better, you know now our economy, and of course so where where's Congress taking us to the fiscal cliff? Yep. So that's kind of not good, and um, 
course, we still have some time, but um, this is all serious stuff, so I don't mean to make light of it. Um, so anyway, in the book, let me get to him. Yeah, I said, oh, this is made, meant to be a wake-up call in the book. I talk about, you know, after the millions of people lost their jobs and faced the anxiety over the possibility that America's best days were behind us. And I grew up in the 60s, and many of the things that we are now facing, the youth of today, I have a son, we have a son, 21 years old. And so um, I, I think... What a different world. I mean, of course, the violence and things that they face in their lives. I mean, the heavy burdens kids have. Um, but I think there's always been burdens in life, no matter what generation, which generation you came through. So they're different, they're just different. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, that's part of what living your life more authentically and in a more simplicity model makes all the sense in the world and to get our kids onto living that not valuing stuff not valuing and that's the beauty of our kids today all of the polls are showing that the youth of today they do not see race as any issue i think that's such a wonderful thing i think that's such a beautiful thing it's so different than when i grew up and i you know i think the kids today, they are growing up with that, and they're growing up with, um, they really, what was the other thing I wanted to say? That and, um, I can't remember now, but there's two things. And that is the one major one, and the second one is, what is it? Environment. Oh, well, that's a concern. They're, you're right, environment. Oh, they're much more into, yes. They're much more aware about things that, you know, generations before weren't even paying any attention to, and in fact, destroying. But, um, you know, there was another, like, Stuff. a... Stuff. Yeah, no, oh, I know. This was it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, what it is is that the kids today are not into um, brands. I loved it. I loved it. They're getting to not want to shop brands. And do you remember when it was a time where everyone had to have polo or I don't know, whatever the brand was of the day, you know? That no longer, they're not shopping those tags. So those big name tags no longer are selling. And in fact, you'll see a lot of them probably at your local Marshalls or TJ Maxx. And that is why. And that's also why department stores are in the sorry state they are. Um, so there's a lot of things pointing in good directions, you know, in this country. Um, so, okay, here's another quote or something I wanted to talk about that um, Pulitzer Prize winner uh, Norman Mailer wrote. And when I, in my research, this really inspired me too. America is going to become a mega banana republic where the army will have more and more importance in America. <coughs> American lives. Mm -hmm. It will be an ever greater and greater overlay on the American system. And before it is all over, democracy, noble and delicate as it is, may give away. My long experience with human nature suggests that it is possible that fascism, not democ democracy, is the natural state. Indeed, democracy is a special condition a condition we will be called upon to defend in the coming years. That will be enormously difficult because the combination of the corporation, the military, and the complex investiture of the flag with mass spectator sports has set up a pre-fascistic atmosphere in American already. Whoa, I read that, I was like, yeah, that's my America, that's it. And I said, this is scary stuff. What really concerned me is that it appears that Mailer was, his predictions, correct almost. I, I really feel I could see this. And I read his, into his warning that we needed to be aware of the military budget in our nation, overshadowing all expenses of this nation, 
like it's doing, when the wealth of our nation is held by a small percentage of the richest people mm -hmm. in the country, which they now are it's now happening, and finally, when it appears as if the big corporations are running our government. And just take a look at the lobbying in this country. Oh my gosh, the Supreme Court. It feels like this is happening. I mean, this is scary stuff. So there's nothing simple about that. Um, I mean, I just point that out because the book is, just so you know, it's not, like I said, it's not about frugality. It's really about talking about identifying a lot of things in our government and in our lives that need to be looked at. And as a reporter, I kind of take that view of how I approach the book. So that was one area I wrote about. And then there's another thing here. Um, oh, here's a quote I love, because this is a Joseph Campbell. And we probably know Joseph Campbell. He's a great guy. He's gone now, but we still can read his great works. And he says, we must be willing to let go of the life we have planned so as to accept the life that is waiting for us. And I felt like that was exactly what I, by talking about the authentic self, getting to your authentic self in my book, that is what I'm talking about. Getting to living the life that is waiting for you, because we all have something that's waiting for us. We don't know where we're going. Nobody does. Everybody has different paths. And, you know, we make choices, though. And so it's, it's kind of going to be better, maybe, for some people to think about choosing a simpler path in life. Because why make things harder on yourself? And for what reason at the end? For stuff. So that's one thing. That's another thing. Um, and then, oh, I know, I should just read quickly, and then I'll, I'll stop. So oh, yeah. I, or I can go on to one about things here with my Meister Eckhart quotes or, um, you know. <laughs> You've got um, time, so don't worry. You've got, still got time. I'm sorry? You've still got plenty of time. Okay, thank you. Tim, right? Yes. Thank you, Tim. Um, so some of the names of these um, chapters, just to give you an idea, maybe those will give you a little bit, um, like, uh, in chapter one was a simplicity revolution, and I should have started by saying this, I apologize. Um, but I haven't spoken to a group for a while about my book. It's been a while now. I sp I've spoken at Women and Children first in the bookstall up in, you know, that north suburb where that 1% live. Which was <coughs> name names. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, uh, so the chapter one was a simplicity revolution. Why now? And I think I explained to you how I felt the foundation of our country is cracked. Um, and chapter two, a tale of two nations, the vanishing middle class. Now, having grown up middle class, um, I really own it. I, I feel very connected to it. I always will. Um, no matter where or who I would become, I, I, I mean, not where, but who, you know, who I would become, I'm always going to be that same girl who grew up. In fact, I describe in my book, I, I thought I grew up middle class, but in fact, we were probably lower middle class. But I didn't know the difference, you know. You grow up in a neighborhood and everybody's got the same. So, you know, it doesn't matter. If you're happy and if you're loved, that's what mattered. And I had a wonderful childhood. I was a very, very happy kid and I loved my parents and I felt love and support. So what more can you ask for, right? So, um, um, and then chapter three is, can't we be a big happy family? And you know I'm talking about Congress when I talk about that chapter. I do talk a lot about get it together, guys, gals. You know, you got to get it together. And then I talk about a very personal moment, chapter four, my moment of life clarity, a simple gift. Um, because I think everybody has a moment of reckoning, or whatever I call it, life clarity. And for me, you can read about my moment, and I don't know if you all have had a moment similar. Maybe not, maybe yes. And if you read it, in my book, you'll read exactly what that was like for me and how I got to understand that the meaning of my life, you, that's really what it is. What is the meaning of your life, you know? And that question became, for me, relationships. And it's not stuff. It's not stuff. It doesn't matter what kind of car I'm driving. It doesn't matter my house, none of that stuff. And so then I have a chapter, um, four guideposts to a simpler life, okay? 
so I lay out some things I feel that will help on that roadway. And then chapter six, look around, the simplicity revolution has begun. And then in chapter seven, our American family values. I found that very interesting writing because I really compare where we have been from World War, from actually the Great Depression, okay? Because this, they call it the Great Recession. Uh, it depended who you talked to because there were very few, a lot of people felt it was a Great Depression here too, the second one. But you didn't want the media calling it that because, you know, perception is, what do they say, you know, two-thirds of the game, right? So um, <clears throat> then I have the New America Pinching Pennies, and Chapter 9, Curbing Your Thirst for Stuff, Chapter 10, Avoiding the Debt Treadmill, a.k.a. the Hamster Wheel. Mm -hmm. Chapter 11, Why, why Physical out. Discipline is Like a Physical Making Fitness a Routine. Right and you'll see the analogies are immense. It's really incredible. So think about that. Think about why is physical discipline like a physical fitness routine? And you'll, you'll think about that. And you say, oh, I never thought of it maybe that way. And you can find a lot of corollaries. I can't say the word, but I know. And chapter 12, cultivating an everyday simpler life. Chapter 13, brother, can you spare a dime? <laughs> Chapter 14, for happiness that lasts, try this. 15, training for the revolution. Reversing America's downward trend. And chapter 16, technology and relationships. Chapter 17, shape up America. Then chapter 18, looking to a simplicity revolution of answers. So I don't proclaim to have all the answers in this book, but I certainly hope to be able to provide people, at least with a roadmap, to think about what they can do to gain some uh, knowledge, wisdom, for their own personal road, looking for some happiness and simplicity. And, um, and I think, you know, hopefully that's what society as a whole <clears throat> in America. And, you know, the, interestingly, the book's been purchased a lot in Britain, so, um, in Australia, a few in Australia, but, you know, I mean, it always interests me because they have some similar situations in Britain with the high unemployment in their youth population. And that's the feedback I've gotten from people, how similar there were things. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm ready for questions and feedback. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so who's got the first lucky question? Gee, uh, I read a book that uh, is a little bit similar to what you're talking about by Morris Berman, it's called Why America Failed. One of the things he says is we have a value of endless progress with no end in sight. What do you say about that? Is progress endless or what is your thought on progress? I do think it's endless, yes, I do. That's my personal opinion. I do think that, that the human brain is never going to be short for ideas and concepts to do, work forward on. Just this, I really believe that. Thank you. All right. I'm an optimist. Um, Francisco. I, I am thinking to uh, analyze <laughs> from the point of view of uh, the guns, uh, germs, and steel. Yes. Jared Thank you. And, yes. Uh, what I, my question is about how do you uh, see the evolution of the United States psychology because of the country that we inherited, the, the, the continent, the size, the wealth, the whole thing. Uh, that's what I wonder if you're looking for that. Well, you know, I'm glad, thank you for mentioning Jared Diamond's book, because I actually, on page uh, 10 or 16, mentioned, you know, that as an activist I need to write about how socially destructive I felt the last few years had been to our society. and. Um, in country, and I read Jerry Diamond's book, and he talks about the serious juncture at which we find our nation right now. Um, well, I, no, he doesn't say that. I'm saying that. Okay, I read his book about how what makes a society destroyed. Okay, 
you know, why do empires collapse? And you know, probably a lot of people are hearing about we're like the Roman Empire collapsing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mentioned, I had a young kid say that to me, and I was like, oh, mm -hmm. what am I going to say to that? I think, yeah. But, um, uh, but in his book, when I read his book, I couldn't help but relate to the facts that he gives for what causes the failure. And I, all of his things cause and effect in the book were, I thought, applied to what, why our, I say our foundation was cracked, or is cracked still. What's the title of that book? Which book? Jared book. Um, why, uh, well, that's one book. Yeah, that's guns. Here's the book I'm talking about, The Collapse, How collapse. Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. Yeah, collapse. Collapse. And I was feeling, when I read that, oh my god, I kind of see us kind of imploding. I talk about the debt implosion, well, that's how I felt about America. Yeah, my question was related to the first one, the gun, germs, and steel, yes. because uh, in there he showed that the geography mo moderates or creates the behavior of that society. And so that's how that applies here. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I have to be honest, I have not read, my husband has read that book, whole book. I have not read the whole book. I read through some of it, so I would think, yeah, I would agree that it, it definitely influences the development of a com com country, the way our we America... We are God's chosen, you know, oh, damn. infinite oh. Oh. You know, space and all that, and yeah. so that form our... Okay. All right, Tim Bolger and then Jeff Trump. All right, can you project maybe five or ten years out and what you see the state of our country might be in? Hey, bring your ball here. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, seriously. Excuse me. Oh. Just where did I put that? Yeah, over here. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, well, that America, for better or worse, is still, I know I talk about that in my book, we're still people wanting in here all the time. You know, every country, there's still people just dying to get to America. And I used to be, I should have mentioned that I do in my book, um, I used to be a host for the International Student Exchange Program for teenagers, okay? So we were, brought in a lot of teenagers to this country that came from all over the world. And um, so you would get these first-hand feedback from these people and hearing their views of America. And it was really a really eye-opening experience. You know, they were young kids, but they, you know, they, boy, they were sure. very sharp. And they do their study abroad when they're juniors in high school from Europe and Latin America. Like we had a boy from, uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, where was he from? Well, Chile. And what was he? Venezuela. 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 And right, in Brazil. And then we had we had one of my favorite students who just stopped in. She was in the country again, so you know her family has money, I guess, right? She's from Tunisia, and she's studying now in um, at the uh, the school in Lebanon, so American University. And she speaks four different languages. And she is a uh, Muslim girl that is one of the most, uh, and you would never ever think this woman, and she probably won't, would ever wear a burqa or, you know, not, the, the, you know some of the Muslim countries aren't like it, so. Uh, Tim, did you get your question? Yes, I just, had, I just right. asked her. It's yeah. uh, Jeff's turn. As long as we've been sort of rattling off books here, I want to ask you about a book. <clears throat> which had significant things to say about the media. And if you, you know, John Ralston saw Voltaire's Bastards, written 15, 20 years ago. Are you familiar with that? No. If not, the, the point is, the drift being that from Gutenberg to Hitler, before Hitler, you had print media dominant, and that was a good thing for the evolution of stuff like democracy. But once you have electronic communications, where, Uncle, where Big Bro knows where the headquarters is of NBC, CBS, etc. Big Bro can put squeeze on those outfits and see to it that they only get online so far. Yeah. Now, in the light of it, when you said about progress, what brought this to mind? Um, do you? Can you imagine that 
the progress that we've all sort of gotten used to in recent centuries might be a quirk of certain technological conditions which pertain during those centuries, but starting roughly with the career of Adolf Hitler, no longer pertain. Yes. Yeah, I do. I mean, uh, you know, that Mailer quote I read to you, you know, that sends ch chills up my spine. Because he talks about how delicate our democracy is. And you know what? And it may be, I, I mean, I call myself now a socialist, I guess. And you know, I'm, you know, well, what was the de demo democratic socialist, right? Yeah, I think that's the term, rather than just socialist. Huh? Democratic Socialist of America. Right. That's yeah. That's what I am. And so, but you know what? I I, I say that now. I think I'm gonna. I'm out of the closet. You know. I want to let people know. Yeah. That's just who I am. I mean, I'm a liberal, progressive, you know, type. And I, the more I look into things, the more I'm appalled at some of the things I see. You know, like about the like environment stuff. I told you. I just like. I'm now a very active in more environment stuff than I was. Uh, Richard Ward. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I agree that, you know, I, I, I also think simplicity is very important. But you seem to be talking about it primarily as relating to individual decisions on how I or someone else is going <coughs> to... I'm sorry. On how, on how somebody is going to live their life, you know. I. I make decisions, you make decisions on the way we live and how simple. Right. And some of the things you talk about, and I'm particularly taken with the, with the Mailer quote, um, because he, he really is speaking about something which is happening right now. Yes, and it's also, at, you know, and the, <laughs> the idea that people had that once a Democrat was elected, the destruction of personal freedom would slow down and it's actually increased. So that, that has not been helped at all by having a Democrat. So, so what I'm asking is if how do personal decisions translate into issues like the destruction of personal freedom which is happening at a governmental level when no one that we no one on the ballot who has a serious chance of winning is going to do anything about it. So how can we, by being simple, by right. having a simpler life, how do we stop this erosion of personal freedom? Well, the first thing is, remember Margaret Mead's, okay, quote in the very beginning. Yeah, but that didn't have to do with personal, with, that didn't, that had to do per, with, indi with individuals no, acting I don't view on it a that governmental, way. acting on a social level, but I'm asking, how do individuals acting on an individual level change the government? Well, you you have to organize. You have to be out there. You have to, like I was talking about earlier, you have to be an activist. You have to be active in your political and what scene. what do you do? What do you do? You, get, you go to community meetings. You go to, okay, for example, here's one of the things that I would love to see the most in government right now. You know, everybody can talk about this or that. I'm into campaign finance reform. I am so tired of seeing only the wealthy being able to run for any office in this country. It sickens me. It's sick, and that's that middle class girl in me coming out. But that should be how this country, now we do have, I guess you could say Barack Obama, he didn't come out as a multi, Millionaire, well, Bill Clinton, originally, originally, or Bill Clinton. That's right. No, no, no. They can divorce yet, according to who was it? That's an, and we don't want single mother. Remember that they said something. I think it was something. And but the last two presidents were raised by single mothers. You know, I mean, it killed me. It's like, um, but uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah, more some great things, you know. Um, yeah, not the, that's right. No. George Bush, that, we don't even like to mention that. I'm sorry. Um, uh, rich. Huh? Plus, he was very, very wealthy. Well, anyway, I don't know. I was back into the campaign finance reform. But that is, that is, see, that is something, if somebody has a hot issue that can affect change in Congress, that's what they have to work on. Because, I mean, we're, we're up against an iron horse. 
But what does that have to do with simplicity? I guess is where I'm going. I'm, not, to make I'm our, trying to connect the two. Well, for me, honesty in government is living a more authentic lifestyle and simple. simple. It's getting down to simplicity in this country. And you're going to get people that are going to vote not for those big corporations and the money that they're churning. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know how everyone in this room feels about guns and gun control. I, I have no idea. But all I know is I have a strong feeling that I don't mind the, you know, people having guns. I do mind having automatic weapons. And I was sickened by what I heard on Friday at that conference. Okay, So that's something I should take on as an act, you know. So that's an example. To me, that's living my life authentically and simply. I'm trying to keep life simple for people. OP? Hey, I have a question. Um, you said you work for a newspaper? A long time ago. And then, would you mind telling us which one? South Town Economist. The South Town Economist, OK. My, my real question is, how do you, what method would you recommend for people to learn what's really happening if the media is running coordinated blackouts on certain subjects that are taboo in America to talk about? Um, you know, there's that local thing now that's really pretty good, the patch. You all connected to that? Huh? I never heard of that. Has anyone heard of the patch? What's the patch? It's on the internet. Yeah, it's on the internet, and I get mine updated every day. And I get local news, and I get local, you know, whatever they've heard about this or that. And some things aren't really positive. There's an internet site? Website? Yes, you can sign up for it, and you get it every day. What's the site? Yeah, and so you sign up, and then I don't know what your area is called here, but, like, you know, north. Can you give us the URL for the site? I'm sorry? The URL for the well, site. Well, I would say it's P-A-T-C-H dot com. You know, Sun-Times is offering that now. Yeah? Oh, so they connected with the Sun-Times? It, it comes up on, it's on, the the on, on my AOL. Oh, the Sun-Times is offered. They're not only, they don't no, own no, the patch. Yeah. They own the patch? On AOL. 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 Okay. Okay. Well, I don't get AOL, so. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, Ed, you, have your, you know, the coat that you came in, that you bought at maybe Goodwill or some other thrift store only existed because somebody paid thousands or hundreds of dollars for it originally. Right. Is simplicity a sustainable economy? Well, I don't know. And that um, I, I think that this coat was so nice that I hate to say it because I had to make me think about it, but I would think somebody's loved one died and they were just putting out the, the clothes. I mean, not putting outside, but I mean, it was like at a Goodwill type thing. Actually, it's a different thrift store in Evanston. And, um, and the coat was made in Italy, okay? So I have no idea what the history was of the coat. No, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> but we don't know the history of any of these things. But and, and I'm not talking about any of those things either. Yeah. What I'm asking you is, is simplicity a viable economy? I know what you're saying. Yeah, because we're a consumer society, is what you're saying. And is simplicity, if we go to a simplistic life, is that sustainable? Well, but Will I be able to get food because the economy is still churning? I believe so. With the millions and millions and millions of people we have in this country, I think so. Because so many people go through their clothes every season, okay? And that's my point. You don't always need to have new or have the best of everything, okay? And um, so, you know, yeah. I mean, there's an economy in thrift stores, too. Let's see. Uh, Bob? I agree with what you said about relationships that are key to a simple and meaningful life, but uh, relationships are incredibly difficult to sustain. And, uh, and society has not really focused around communities such as our cities. So, uh, so I was wondering if you could just tell us more what you say about uh, I do. I do talk about that. I talk about people need to get more involved in their communities. And, you know, it's, uh, as you know, and many of us know in this room, that if you live in a big condo building or something, you may not even know the people who live down the hall anymore. And that's sad. That is so different how 
we, I grew up. Uh, people, everybody knew everybody on every block around you. And anymore where I live, that's really not the case. Other than I get to know people by getting involved in local community efforts and things. And that is how I met many of my friends. And by that, when I say relationships, I'm talking about I am very, very, very pleased. I have some wonderful friends. I am so happy to. I have friends for you know 38, 40 years now. You know. How, how do you keep uh, strong personal relationships in super stressful times like this? The internet. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's virtual. Like, it's what? Hurtful? Virtual. Oh, virtual. oh a virtual. Yeah, well, no. Yeah, you make, yeah, make plans to get together. I'm going to go for coffee. You want to meet for lunch. You know. I mean, I mean it just makes it easier, you know. And I mean, I, I'm just online writing all the time. So I'm online, you know, just getting emails from friends. And I keep in contact that way. And, you know, on the phone. And it, I, it you know, it's, it's a, you just have to invest something in your relationships. And that's, as you know, it's a very, very fulfilling thing and you never know. I mean, sometimes people who you never would have thought can become such good friends become very, very good friends. Okay, Charlie say it up. Yeah, I'll sue you in your addendum. You have a whole chapter here. Um about Socrates. Are are you are you advocating his lifestyle? He was something like a bum. <laughs> yes. I, mean, I was wondering do you think young people should be reading this? Like this you don't know, this guy didn't do any what, sit in the park and talk about the big truth? You know, I was, you know, we're quoting him how many centuries later. Come on, they're not going to be quoting me. How many centuries later? So, you know, well, maybe. All right, uh, Bob Matter. Okay, uh, do you think that the. Uh, Fruits of a person's labor belong to them. Depends what the initial agreement is when you have the fruits of those labors come, and you know that. You sound like a labor person. So. <laughs> 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 well, well, you know, I mean, if you sign an agreement that I'm willing to develop this software program and I'm going to be paid X amount of dollars while I do it. No, you don't own that anymore. You signed a contract to do that for that person, whoever the company was. So the fruits of your labor, though, would be the money that you accepted for writing that program. Oh. You've been fucked. That's would be the fruits of your labor. Oh, well, well of course, everybody deserves to be paid okay, for their labor. So, so isn't uh, under uh, socialism somebody else taking the fruits of your labor without your permission? You know, involuntarily, isn't that a tort? Take from the rich and give to the poor, right? I mean, how is that different from theft? If I just come and take money out of your purse, uh, it's still taking money, you know, or, if I, or if, if I do it with a gun, or if I do it with a with a law, it's still taking, you know, something that you produce, the fruits of your labor being taken away from you uh, involuntarily. How's that? How's That's that capitalism, different? man. That's capitalism. Yay! Yay! That's capitalism. Yeah. Where does capital come from? Who yeah. didn't think you're useful word social? Yeah, 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 that's right. He twisted in a way that it fits his. Oh, look. One full So, So, what's your answer? You're talking a Marxist theory, and no. Communist. It's not that. According to what, what, what do you know what? Are you not entitled to the future of labor? I am. It's not in the society. Yes. See, that's the question. Yeah. See, that's the question. You don't need a question. Your world's too simple. Are you at all influenced by, I, I can't remember this author's name, but in the TV she wrote, Thank you again. Very good. Thank you. It was like Sarah Bauer Burnwright or something like that. And, and then a whole list. No, I don't think. But she was like more, like totally spiritual. 
but about also paring down stuff. No. But you seem to go off on these political and activist tangents, which really surprised me because yeah. I was expecting more of her, like, oh, okay. whole, yeah. homey philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. No. So you're, you're kind of like, you know, <laughs> bottling my mind. No, sorry. I talk a lot about, you're right, I talk a lot about government type okay. things and the current situation in the country. So, you know, as a reporter, more or less. Okay. Way. Well, and then I have, I think, two more parts of questions. Um, a while ago, a friend was sending me a subscription to the New York Review of Books, and there was a book in there. It was like, it, either spending or shopping is good for the environment. And I was, I really would love to read that book if I could remember yeah, I would the like, title. Sounds of it. like tortured reasoning. <laughs> yeah, because I, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on how that might be true, and I'm not no. sure what that has. To I think it's not true. Probably. Simplicity, yeah. And then the other thing was, oh, um, have you heard of that um, internet-based movement? where this woman decided to just have 10 pieces of clothing that she was going to wear for six months. Yeah, that was written about in the New York yeah, Times. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Too. But and, and so mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. less, mm -hmm. to spend less energy on what you're going to wear every day, you, you sort of like become in touch with your authentic self. It frees you up to be more creative in other ways. Correct. And, uh, but I just, I thought that was kind of an interesting move. People don't really, really, Notice what you're wearing and things like that, but um, yeah, I I don't know. Your your presentation is very interesting to me and a little confusing because I I want something more concrete about simplicity, but but it's it's very interesting. Yeah, no, I, I don't have a concrete answer on simplicity. You know, I don't proclaim that in the book. So sorry. All right, Doug Binkley. Yeah, uh, is part of your uh, book uh, uh, if you did espouse. Uh, uh, the use of uh, solar and renewable energies, uh, specific recommendations of how to do that for an individual? I would love to, but you know what? Um, I have to say, I had to cut out about 150 pages, because when I originally had done this, um, they told me, oh, you have too many numbers. The readers get this. This, this is scary, because I'm not a known author, you know, so you're not going to have a real tolerant public out there waiting for my book. And they said, Readers today, they don't want to read statistics, okay? And I had, this was chock full of a lot of statistics in the beginning. They don't want to read statistics, you know, so they don't want that. And they, so, you know, if you can edit out some of those statistics, that would be really, really good. Anyway, there were some statistics about, you know, using Germany as an example of where this country needs to be heading and, um, and a lot of other examples on, you know, the needs in the environmental. So I did have that, but a lot of that I had to take out. They told me that readers have, get this, you'll all be insulted, I was, but readers today have the uh, uh, a capacity of about a gnat. <laughs> Boy, we that's, are smart. That that's your publishing industry, yeah. That's what they think of you. Oh, I have a question. How much is well, it was ten dollars. I say it was because I just heard Powell's is offering those books for ten dollars, five dollars. No, on Amazon they're a lot less. Oh, oh no, they're not. No, 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 no. they're back there on the the cover price. But I would make them five dollars for people here tonight because yeah, because I was supposed to speak here once before and unfortunately, um, I blew it. Oh. <laughs> The $10 should be worth it because it's a signed author's edition. And I will sign it. And I will, um, but I'm offering to anyone hey, for $5. So. Bargain time. Well, I mean, I hate to do that, but yeah. Let's see, somebody had their hand up. Uh, um, Tim. Okay. There is a phenomenon that I've heard just recently that Japan is about 10 years ahead of us, where we would be economically. Would what would your view be on that? Um, meaning that Japan you know, has a lot of debt, they've been a stagnant economy, they've done a lot of things. Do you think we're headed more specifically down that road like the Japanese are doing right now? And in effect, America is quote unquote turning Japanese up? <laughs> well, I don't know, stagnification, and I don't think that's going to happen here. I think a lot was learned from watching what happened in Japan. So I know our, um, I think they've done a pretty good job. 
And, you know, to his credit, um, Obama really handled a very tense situation when he got in. Um, and he did, you know, a lot of things right. And if he didn't do those things right, I think we could have really been off the, you know, they're talking about the fiscal cliff now. That could have been off another cliff at that time. But, you know, they, they've learned a lot. So they, I think they're the uh, banking and, um, I mean, the SEC rules still need to be cleaned up as far as I'm concerned. But as, as a corollary to the question, Cubs or Sox fan? Me? No. Cubs are never going to win. Just forget it. I'm not really a sports fan. And as they say in Mailer's, as Mailer said in his thing, we have this sports bravura. You know, that, you know, like, you know, what do they say? You know, you know, the bears, bear. oh, oh, oh. Right. Uh, you know, it does, it becomes like this, uh... All right, Bob Matter is next. Okay, now you're, uh... Advocating simplicity, so are you, you're, are you advocating like simplistic lifestyles like moving from a car to a bicycle? Or from a, and from a bicycle to on foot? I mean, is that what we should be, be our goal? Well, I think from a health standpoint, yes. And then, well, so what is the, what is, what, what is the driving factor here? Why should we have a simplistic lifestyle? Is it for, are we supposed to be happier? Walking, then we would be driving our Cadillac somewhere? Or? Well, we would be if we um, were breathing the air, and I think we're all breathing the air, so, you know, yeah, I mean, you gotta, you know, that's where we have to take some responsibility in this country and own things that we're doing wrong, and you look at every other nation, you look at Europeans, and oh my gosh, they love their bikes, they'll bike for miles without thinking twice. So, I mean, we need to, and we're doing that now. We're, it's starting big time in this country. Are we the principal driver for the simplification that for the environmental benefits, or is it supposed to make us happier? Or I what? think it does both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll have more still light, you know, use yeah. a uh, knife instead of a, instead of a, instead of a food processor to, you know, cut our carrots <laughs> or whatever. I mean, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> okay, Jeff Robin. Yes, ma'am. As long as you're getting so many questions about the simplified lifestyle, I have to ask: Are you familiar with Arch Druid John Michael Greer, who is one of the better-known folks in what you might call the prepper community, who argues that we're going to have to simplify our lifestyle? Nature is going to make us do it, and eventually we're going to go through what he calls a phase of the salvage economy, where you're going to, you know, all this stuff, you're going to find uses for it because you ain't going to be able to make new stuff because the party's ending. Any yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm already having to do that. I'm yeah. salvaging yeah. things. I look through things and say, wow, I can I use this since that. And, you know, that's, uh, things are reusable. That's the beauty of things. You don't need to run out and buy a new this or that, you know? His website is the Archdruid Report. <laughs> and he publishes every week, and it's, there's, you know, yeah. hundreds no, of comments. Okay, I'll check that out. Uh, <coughs> Thanks, Charles. Thanks so much, Yeah, no, Sue, the labor guy, I know many people are like one paycheck or two paychecks away from bankruptcy. But another way of looking at this is that people are living on an equilibrium, meaning what they take in, it goes out. And isn't that the way a system is most efficient and operational? Isn't that, you, you've got a problem with that? You know what, living on the edge, that's um, so many people have in this country right now, more than ever. I mean, you know, the youth that are just graduating, we have over, they have over, it's a trillion dollars in college debt alone. These kids are graduating from college owing what is uh, akin to having a mortgage on a first home. And, you know, I mean, so these are sad times. I'm not sure, this book doesn't try to make short of any of that, Charles, not at all. I mean, if I did, I, I failed because I never, ever took it lightly. I mean, I, like I told you earlier, I felt a lot of pain in seeing how badly some of this economy has stunned people and losing their homes and, you know, and, um, 
and I personally have some single uh, divorced women that are older who lost jobs and they're and this is happening all the time and they're she lost her job when she was 60 or no she was younger than she was maybe 58 but after she worked there for 13 14 years the company went out of business and you know there she is and she had a ton of debt and you know she's had a really tough time of it she's a very dear friend of mine and um so that's just one out of millions and millions and millions of stories out there, you know, and um, and people who can't, they don't eat out, I can tell you, they're not living, you know, any, not living the American dream, <laughs> shall we say. And so many people aren't, and so many people are even confused, they're asking, is this what the dream was? Because it's more like a nightmare, you know. So I've tried to hope, I hold out hope. I think we will, we can get it back, get things shaken out. And I really do think that we got to get some campaign finance reform in this country. But. Yeah, I, I just want to ask, I think I wasn't able to tell from what you or from Brown said about your, your like your work resume. But anyway, have you worked as a journalist for many, many years? You, you mentioned you were in the Illinois Racing Board, but after that you were a journalist. Have you worked essentially in the journalism field for many, no, many years? No, I worked essentially in the journalism field until I got offered a job in the Thompson administration. And it paid so much more than my job as a journalist, which wasn't really allowing me to live you know, I was, you know, living hand to mouth back then, and so I just, I took the job, and it was really a, a good move, because I got to work some, with, being a Democrat my whole life, I, I felt awkward, you know, but the good thing is, I ran into Governor Thompson not that long ago, and I was able to tell him, you know, how much I appreciated always being one of the, not few, but one of the, a Democrat working for this Republican, you know, administration. Because they used to joke with me a lot of times about kick her off the plane or something. Because there were a few of us, you know, Democrats on the plane. Our boss was Republican, and um, and he said, yeah, it was a different time, wasn't it? It was really different back then. What, what type of employment have you had since the Thompson administration, which was a long time ago? Yeah, it was. Well, I've done a lot of different things. From there, I went to work for a company. I was the vice president of operations for Intertrack Partners, which was a company owned by the racetrack owners. Okay, and they own a lot of things in the city of Chicago. People don't even realize, like the East Bank Club, and they own a lot of businesses. And so, um, and then they set up these inter these off-track betting parlors, and you know, so I was charged with, you know, running the operations for this company. From there, I went to work myself, the president and the CFO. We started up our own consulting company. And then we were asked to set up a casino. So we set up one of the riverboat casinos here in Illinois, down in southeast uh, Illinois. Southeast, what is it? Southeast, no, Saint, East St. Louis. Oh my gosh, how could I forget? East St. Louis, the casino queen. So I did that for several years. And then from there, I went to work for, as I mentioned, Peapot. Okay, mm -hmm. and I did that for several years, and so I worked in the IT business, and um, um, then I went to work for a, a management consulting firm, Summit Consulting, in downtown Chicago, and I did that for about, about six years. So I mean, it's been you know I kept staggering, but every every job I had always required a lot of writing, and people would hire me to kind of either wordsmith or whatever they would call it. So. Okay. Uh Bob, okay. another question. Last now, question. I'm a little bit confused oh, now. Yeah. Do you want people to live simpler lives, or do you want the economy to improve so they can go back to living the way they used to before the crash, which would be leading, leading a less simple life? So these these uh, CTA employees, for instance, that are laid off, they can get a job again, they, they can go back to having their cottage in Wisconsin, a snowmobile, and, we do want people, we want the economy to get better so people can get back into the, you know, how they used to be, or do you want people to actually live a simpler life? I want people's lives, I would love to see our economy fully recover. So I'm not espousing or, or saying, you know, down with um, 
uh, everyone's purchase power. Okay, <clears throat> I'm not saying that. I understand that this is an, uh, you know, okay. the middle class is what runs our economy, and that's why these tax breaks that they're talking about, you know, uh, this whole thing on this fiscal cliff about the taxes makes me sick. But anyway, let's go to rebuttals, Brom. Yes, uh, Andy. Can you give us an idea? What what do you think is the best method to help Americans become educated on what's really happening in the country versus the image presented by the media, like the false image, you know, right. propaganda? That's right. I, I, I would suggest. Yeah, I would suggest. And I bet a lot of people in this room, like if you're going to watch any journalist, you know, you're going to want to pick somebody that's does the best at it, you know. And for me, I know I really like watching Charlie Rose his interviews and I find it to be the most educated, you know, insight into the situation. What other sources are there, do you think, that are really good? Other well, than just Charlie Rose. I'm yeah, well there's a lot. I mean there's the Foreign Affairs magazine, okay. Um, in these times yeah, in these times. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things out there. You just have to, you know, just like you would purchase, you know, quality, whatever clothing or anything. You got to know when you're you're reading bullshit and like a. I bet this. Well, I shouldn't say this. I would bet there's one in this room who buys the bullshit on Fox News right here. You know, or the Wall Street Journal. Right. That's yours. You know, I mean, I, I like the Wall Street Journal in terms of the news goes. You know, but I can't stomach their. You know. Yeah, I can't stomach them. Okay, Charlie. Yeah, Sue, now I understand they're, they can't wait for Black Friday. They're like opening stores on Thanksgiving so people <laughs> can get a, to cancel like Thanksgiving dinner so they can go shopping. And then gunfights are breaking out. And you come out with a book on simplicity. I know. And I'm just wondering how do you feel there's going to be a... A big audience for this, or well, what? What is? What in essence is going wrong? Here? Well, it doesn't funny. seem I, that. I'm well, I'm why don't you stand out front of that, that store with your book on simplicity? I'm sorry, what? No, stand out the on Black Friday and try and sell the book. You know what? <laughs> I don't think anybody makes a book, uh, make money for them, that's done on a small basis. You know. Um, Really, you know, you, those people think they're going to sell a million copies or something, you know. Oh, I'm just dreaming. talking about you trying to sell your book to that crowd. Wouldn't Is it going to work? Would, you, would they buy it? It doesn't Black seem Friday. like... Uh, oh, oh, the They way. are no, not going to no, want this no. book. Oh, I got you now. I got you. No. <laughs> yeah, they buy it for gifts for their simplistic you know. neighbors. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's... Uh, all right, Rob. Uh, I think we're going to have to move into our rebuttal period. But Bob has a question. Last question. Uh, regarding authenticity, which I think is crucial, um, you said uh, you think there's authenticity in waiting for each person. We just have to find what it is. In what waiting? What waiting for you is what you said. There's authenticity. I heard you correctly. You did. Oh, okay. Well, I just wondered about um, um, what you would say, how we could be more authentic selves. Uh, isn't, isn't, doesn't real authenticity come from developing your own ideas? Uh, yes. Pretty much independent of what yes. society thinks, pretty much more yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and like I said, I, I don't. Claim to have, you know, tell anybody here what's right for them because you got to find it for yourself. All I do is I rate side knowing, lay things out. Hopefully, this is a little bit of a roadmap to help you think about what might be a possibility for your life and what worked for me. So that's all you can do. Right. All right. All right. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm ready. Bring it on. Bring it on. Okay. All right. I'd like to see hands for how many people have something to impart to the rest of us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
Twelve. Make it about six minutes, Brom. Five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, that would be an hour. Uh, Let's make it five. There'll be more. Yeah. Five. We'll try for, with five minutes. Yeah. And some of the rest of us might be inspired. <laughs> <laughs> something that I've been developing for a while as to understand what's going on. And uh, like we say, one fool at a time it applies for everybody. If we don't pay attention to other people, how would we expect to solve the problems that we are confronted with? This is a thing that we go every time on the College of Conferences. There is no respect. There is no care for each one. It's just, it's just the way it is. We don't. Um, but anyway, what I was trying to say was that I developed this understanding of, uh, and I put it in this simple way, I think. Without science, we are lost. We are blind. And without heart, we are doomed. <coughs> if we don't use both together, we are not going to come out of this nightmare in one piece. Uh, simplicity is very good, uh, but this economy is built on consumption and it's not sustainable. We are raping the earth, every corner of the earth is not only being raped the earth itself, but the people living in it. Uh, when uh, people are abused, uh, because we destroy their water or their land, we beat them up or kill them. Uh, this is what we are doing right now in Argentina, in Brazil, in Ecuador, in Africa, uh, to mine uranium, to mine other minerals. We are continuous doing this brutality that started when the Europeans jumped jump into the New World. And now uh, we expand it everywhere. Wherever we can put our mm. grip in there, we, we continue doing it. So uh, the, the things that have to be changed, they are very profound. The system is, is corrupt for a long time. And uh, it's not going to be solved because we save a little bit on clothes. We, we at home, or, or I myself, have been living uh, <coughs> very simply by buying things in the second-hand store and all that, but that, that's, that's minimal. We throw in 4,500 tons of plastic into the sea every day. We are throwing thousands of tons of fertilizers into the sea every day. This is a disaster. What the fuck are we doing? The sea is it's, it's a disaster in the sea. In, the, in 2050, uh, if you go and listen to the lectures at the Shed Aquarium and other scientific uh, places, the sea is going to collapse of uh, major life forms whales, dolphins, and, and fish that we, we use as to, for food, is going to collapse by 2050. That means that you will throw anything in the sea and where the only you pick up is algae or, 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 or corals. This is a disaster that we are not reacting as we are protecting our home. If somebody will be doing that to your home, you grab a machine gun and you kill them. But we are not doing that. We are just going around, you know, conserve this little bit, don't use this, use a used sweater. We need to change the system. And the system is not here in the United States. It, it co captured the whole world. This is a capitalist system. It had no limit to the way that they want to extract the wealth of every human being 
to facilitate some other people to uh, uh, spend uh, luxuriously. This uh, wealth that is created by our hands, by these muscles, is being taken away, sucking up to no good ends. So we have to. Now, to the Roman Empire, the fall of the Roman Empire is very, very relevant to our country. When the Roman Empire was in, in, its, in its good times, people were very, very anxious to in, go into the Roman Empire and to become citizens. And as they become citizens, they become soldiers. They defend, they were obligated to defend the empire. But they were all obligated to pay taxes. They were obligated to and participate into the governing. So when they went to the govern, uh, uh, when they were governed, the big guys, the big shots, like the Republicans trying to control everything, there were people in the Senate that they were buying the little farms in the outskirts of Rome, of the empire, and then they were combining them and running by slaves. So the people couldn't compete with these, the other farmers, and they said, what the fuck, why are we defending Rome when they are screwing us? And when they went to the Senate, the guys who were the manipulators were there, so they didn't listen to them. This is what is happening to us. Our soldiers are going and killing themselves and coming back and committing suicide. Why is that? Because they come and they realize they have no life in here. They don't, per they don't belong here. So this is a crime that we are committing, that is a crime that it will go into history as one of the worst governments, governments in the history of humanity. It is clear from our speaker's presentation, and I thank you very much, it was quite illuminating, um, that simpl simplicity as a lifestyle is possible only uh, in a society. And I don't mean uh, this in a pejorative way, but that's sort of a shell game. Sue shell? Yeah, got it. <laughs> got it. <laughs> oh. um, we get that a lot. We get that <laughs> I, I also <laughs> wanted to make a note on uh, the, the, uh, our speaker's uh, quote from Margaret Mead that it takes a small group of people who, uh, to, to start things and to, it's the only way to change it. Remember the founding fathers of our country were a small group of people among all of those in the uh, uh, British colony called the America at that time. And they were very active and uh, they had a lot of money, they were big landowners, and uh, they managed to manipulate the other people to defend their position, their simplicity, <coughs> their simple lives, uh, which depended upon slavery and other nasty things. But uh, they were that small group of people. And uh, so if they can do it, I don't see why we can't do it. It's very, very, very difficult to do, but if persistence pays off. Um, one of the other things that uh, I thought that she brought up was the role of the army, and uh, Francisco also mentioned the role of the army. Um, the soldiers that we have now serving the United States uh, are, vo are volunteers. There's no draft army, there's a volunteer army. And they do come home, and they do either uh, commit suicide, uh, find no work, or stay in the army. Um, However, their role will be to control the rest of us who are seeking the simple life uh, in, po in opposition to those who are uh, already living that simple life, that 1%. Uh, this is quite clear from the formation of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That had two, uh, two goals. One was to push Russia back to its original boundaries, and it couldn't do that. The second goal is still in operation, and that was to make sure that if an insurrection occurred in Czechoslovakia, it would be French soldiers who put it down, and vice versa, so that those 
insurrections would, would not be put down by the native soldiers in that country, but by other foreign-speaking um, soldiers. Um, the, in, uh, I mentioned this a few weeks ago uh, in the, the journal New Scientist, uh, a, a group of mathematicians, social scientists, psychiatrists, and others uh, made a study in which they concluded uh, that before the end of this decade there would be a violent revolution in the United States and in Europe. And basically it was the uh, ability of the 1% to, uh, to keep the money that they want and without giving back to the so-called middle class. Uh, the middle class is another problem for me because the Internal Revenue Service doesn't define middle class. It defines income groups. And for most of us who are here, who live uh, professional lives or working lives, or street sweepers, garbage men, whatever, uh, we are known as the lower income group. And that doesn't sound like middle class to me, but that's what they call us. It makes us feel good. Uh, I want to answer to uh, Bob Matter's uh, question, uh, if I may, Bob. Uh, you said, are we entitled to the fruits of our labor? And uh, yes, we are, providing that we live in a society that makes our, the fruits of our labor possible. You can live on the fruits of your labor if you live on a desert island and you're all by yourself. You can have everything that you produce. But if you live in a society, the society makes it possible for you to enjoy some of the fruits of your labor as long as you help distribute that to the rest of us. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I like to put things in personal terms if I can. Uh, it sounds like your book is worth five bucks, and I'll buy one. <laughs> Uh, I personally, by the time I get home tonight, I will have walked 49 blocks, at six miles. Uh, of course, that doesn't say much for my virtue. My eyes went bad. So, I do walk around, also walk around a lot for my own health. So, I would certainly recommend that if you want to simplify your life. As long as you don't walk east. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, now, the speaker talked about uh, influencing your government. My idea of that, again, personal, is get into community organizing. I've seen repeatedly my alderman, my state representative, my state senator, and my U.S. rep uh, personally face-to-face -face numerous times. So whatever little influence I've got, which goes through a group, uh, is because of that. Uh, if you haven't met all those people or go up with those people, uh, my question is, how are you going to influence them? Uh, writing letters, I did a lot of that before community organizing. It's better than nothing, but it isn't community organized. Uh, we heard about books. We heard about uh, Jared Diamond's two books, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and Collapse. I read both of them. Uh, I would also recommend, to balance that off, Morris Berman's book, uh, Why America Failed. Uh, Jared Diamond is far more uh, optimistic. He's actually more optimistic than I am. And of course, let me just say, the guy lives in L.A. Okay, so if you live in L.A., you got to be a certain kind of person. Uh, Morris Berman, however, left the country. He said, I've had enough. I'm going. I'm not that pessimistic, but I would say it's a good balance to what uh, Jared Diamond uh, had to say. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Doug Binkley. Uh, I, you know, I've mentioned this before, uh, that uh, uh, I wrote a science fiction story back in 1975, which uh, I guess it was the 
uh, envision a future which could have been the, the peak of simplicity because people all lived underground and they just had walls really and like if they wanted <clears throat> if they wanted to see part of a book they could present it on the wall but just by saying it um, you know Das Kapital or something or if they wanted a scene from Hawaii they would say uh, uh, scene off of Hawaii or uh, they wanted the Berlioz Requiem they would just call it up by by speaking, so you wouldn't even have to enter a URL, I guess. Um, but um, um, and that and that um, uh, civilization would have survived by just um, using Isaac Asimov's idea that he had for the uh, great um, capital of uh, the Galactic Empire, <laughs> Trantor, using the differential of the uh, uh, the energy, uh, the heat uh, from um, uh, down beneath, uh, which some people now use uh, to heat their homes ge geothermal. Um, um, as far as, um, I don't know exactly if that's the vision of the speaker, um, I guess I'll have to read her book um, to find that out, um, but um, uh, that was envisioning a future where people would have very few things, and of course I'm one of the terrible people that um, uh, stores everything practically that I've accumulated my entire life and can't throw anything away, so uh, that is a, uh, perhaps there's a chapter that explains to me how I can uh, get beyond that. Um, but um, uh, we have um, we have uh, a lot of challenges, and um, uh, I do uh, hope that uh, the next generation, of course, uh, being um, uh, coming from a standpoint of not having accumulated so many things, maybe they'll find that easier. Uh, certainly, I can't get used to the idea of uh, having uh, one of these nooks uh, where you can't, uh, you know write in the margins or mark things in the margins. I understand some of the newer models might allow you to do that. So um, it might be possible for me to change my uh, ways. Um, but um, as you know, also, I'm a progressive, and uh, I also call myself sometimes a democratic socialist, uh, too. And um, I hope that we can uh, at least arrive, perhaps, uh, at uh, a more, uh, a better society by doing some of the things that our speaker presented. Thanks. All right, I'm going to go early on usual here, but let's thank our speaker again. Thanks for welcoming us to the all going to be eclectic as usual and be quicker. When I think about materialism is how I approach this topic, and with this, this, uh, anniversary, this December, 21st thing, I was thinking of the conquistadors. Now these were the guys who were the ultimate materialists. I mean, they came here with one, one they wanted stuff, man. And no one was going to get in their way, you know. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I lectured for about 10 years on uh, Pioneer Life. People may not know this at the Chicago Historical Society. Um, but interesting. It, uh, Abe Lincoln type 1840s and things like that. Um, people certainly had a simplistic lifestyle. Uh, they made virtually everything themselves. And I'm also a transportation guy, and the thing that changed that um, was uh, the railroads. Because you could get merchandise. And there's a lot written on the social history of this nation. And they often overpassed that. Suddenly, you got store-bought stuff, and the certainly the amount of things that you—it's one thing to make things yourself, but it's tremendously labor-intensive. And manufactured goods, if anything, are generally a better quality than like Lindsay Woolsey clothing. Trying to make your own clothing is an enormous thing. I could talk about that. For, it's amazing how much time it took just to make clothing and things like that. And make all the soap and whatever, all your personal items and things like that is, is just incredible. The other thing about real life, I lived in the mountains to the Appalachia, and it always, I always remarked that everything we needed was in that town. And you didn't venture out over the mountains. And I remember, I did one time, I broke down, I bought some stuff from Sears Roebuck through the catalog. I remember I bought a pair of shoes. <laughs> that was just uh, something else there. The other thing about simplicity, there was that documentary about the Dust Bowl. Yeah. And they interviewed oh, yeah. the one farming family, and they were in their 90s, whatever. 
and apparently they survived the dust bowl, but he survived the dust bowl because he was still using equipment from 1920. And he never upgraded his stock. The other thing about equipment, I like photography. But I don't, to a large degree, questions of authenticity are not really ones that an individual makes in isolation. Some of us may be lucky enough to live the kind of life where you can make a lot of those decisions, but that's, that's probably a minority. People who are, who are living in oppressed economic circumstances are, are, or who are in this uh, country facing deportation and, and all of that sort of thing cannot live authentic lives.
You can't live authentic life when you're starving, and you can't live authentic life when you're worried about the knock on the door. Okay? The people who went out into and tried political action, who went out into the parks with the Occupy movement, many of whom ended up in jail, many of whom ended up being beaten by police, etc., those folks were trying to be authentic, but the society didn't do a real good job of encouraging it. Yeah, I agree. So you have to look. You have to look at the at all of those all of those situations. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank our speaker uh, for uh, uh, coming out tonight uh, and uh, 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 you know, putting yourself in front of this. At least this being group, authentic, friend. Uh, being our punching bag for the evening. Uh, you, uh, a couple of short lines from uh, uh, Progress and Poverty by Henry George. Oh, no. Humans are the only animals whose desires increase as they are fed. The only animal that is never satisfied. The wants of every other living thing are fixed. The ox of today aspires to no more than the ox that humans first yoked. The only use they can make of additional supplies or additional opportunities is to multiply. <laughs> but not so humans. No sooner are our animal wants satisfied than new wants arise. The beast never goes further, but humans have just set their foot on the first step of an infinite progression. Once the demand for quantity is satisfied, we seek quality. As human power uh, to gratify our wants increases, our aspirations grow. At the lower levels of desire, we seek merely to satisfy our senses. Moving to higher forms of desire, humans awaken to other things. We brave the desert and the polar sea, but not for food. We want to know the, how the earth was formed and how life arose. We toil to satisfy a hunger no animal has felt, a thirst no beast can know. So anyway, that's excellent. So anyway, yeah, it's kind of a general one of the axioms of political economy is that you know humans are the you know we are the one animal whose desires are never satisfied you know, they're, they're insatiable and just like they, they, they mentioned here once once your uh, quantity is met then you go for the quality so you know once that the worker gets that Chevy now is you know, and that's mad. Now, he, now he aspires to have the Cadillac. That's not an attribute. And then, and then the Mercedes. And it, it certainly is. And this is a, a, one of the the first book we read in the political economy book club was Thorsten Veblen's theory of the leisure class. We talked about status and how status arose. And I believe, I believe in there, I think he talked about a spoon, the theory of the spoon. That you know, at first you have a wooden spoon that serves its purpose. But then some guy wants to have, to have more status. Another guy wants to have a silver spoon. Then another guy wants to be now to be, have more status than him. There's a guy that wants a gold spoon. And then there's a guy that wants a platinum spoon to even be better. Now, now they're more fancier and they're carved, you know, they're, they're ornate, ornately engraved. And then the, finally there's a guy that wants the platinum spoon yeah. with you know with gems you know on the hand or diamonds. <laughs> and so it never ends. You know, it's you know it's it's, it's status. So that's something, you know, that's just, justification that's, for capitalism. That's just part of, well, that's just part, of human, capitalism. part of human nature, it's status, you know, this comes from uh, all the way from when, you know, when we were tribal, uh, you know, when we were just, you know, hunters and gatherers, uh, the, uh, the guys that, you know, the guys that speared the big animals, uh, they got the horns and the teeth, and they wore them around their neck, right? They hung them above their teeth. That was status. They were the big man on campus, right? They were the big chief. You know, those are the ones that were elevated to chiefs. So when they when they uh, when they took over another tribe, they got the they got the women, right? And, those, and, the, and then the wealth that those women created, that went to the chiefs. So we have to go in and say... Well, I'm just saying, this is, this is nature. This is human nature. This is human nature. This is strife and status. And uh, so it's, it's, really, it's going against the grain to try to... Listen, well, however, I would bet... Uh, oh, I would bet $1,000 that I probably live a simpler life than, our, than the author here. Uh, I'd be almost what? certain of it. Probably, what? What's that? What are you making that assumption on? 
Well, I'm, because yeah, I know that I live a simple life, and I know that most people can't live a simple life. But how do you know life you live simple life? <laughs> I'm just making that assumption. I know you are. Uh, he bet yeah, I mean, so, do, do, you, do, you, do you have a car? Do you have a car? We could make some money. Do you have a car? Well, yes or no? This is yes or no. Is there an automobile at your address? There is. Okay, I have. A, I do not have an automobile. I've not had one for ten years. I have a bicycle. Okay. Do you have air conditioning? Yeah, but Bob, you got chauffeurs. <laughs> you have air. You got chauffeurs, Bob. <laughs> you got chauffeurs. <laughs> Right? Train I mean, I don't, bus have, I don't have air conditioning. I haven't had air conditioning. Oh, oh, oh. You live in a single family home or a multi family home? Probably it's Evanston, I'm guessing, single family. I don't think there's too many people in Evanston that have a simpler life than somebody that lives in a basement apartment in Hammond, Indiana. I'm just saying that doesn't have a car. I don't have a dishwasher. I don't have a food processor. You know, I don't even have an electric can opener. I do have a microwave. I have to say that. I'm a bachelor. I do have a microwave. You have refrigeration? I have a refrigerator. I have a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you so, you so, 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 uh, somebody would probably take it. <laughs> cats would. Somebody's got the neighbor's goddamn cats would probably come over and start eating. It. <laughs> well, to my surprise, I've enjoyed hearing most of the comments today. Um, what I really enjoy about the college is that there's always something to learn. And as a speaker, you always come away with learning something. Um, simplicity is not something I'm for. As other people have said, you really have to have a society to afford simpl simplicity. Um, it's, it's, it's simplicity is on the backs of others. Um, now, if you want to say responsibility, to lead a responsible life, that's something different. Um, I remember reading Howell and Ginsburg, who saw like the, you know, the, the youth of his generation destroyed. And I remember uh, growing up in the 60s and seeing the youth of my generation destroyed by simplicity. People who were good people, smart people, educated people, who just disappeared. Um, simplicity is uh, very expensive. I, I just can't see it as an economic system. I can't see it as a cultural system. I can't see any good coming out of it. I, I can only see what happened in the 60s, which was all of those things disappeared and all of those people suffered. Thank you. Our author is advocating a simplistic lifestyle. I think what she means is finding your authentic self. Well, it's kind of funny because many of the leading economists who predict, you know, what's going to happen in the next few years about those companies that succeed and those companies that fail are going to be those that cater to your desires. Those that add an artistic component to their products so they can increase their profit margins. Most of you ladies already know the power of branding, the power of fashion, the, what it means to take a certain brand or look. As a matter of fact, in the 1920s, I think it was Fabergé who invented cosmetics. And look at how that industry's taken off over the last 70 to 80 years. The next thing you've got to remember is we've been in this era before. We've been here before. If you take a look at the immediacy after the Civil War of 1865 to about 1917, we had some of the largest economic growth in this country, as well as real radical change. Now, I'm going to also, at the same time, we had a shift of workers from the countryside into the cities, and we had more most of the companies were not paying that good of wages. We have a 
we have some percentage uh, not being paid and being taken advantage of, but not in the mere numbers that there were back in the 19-teens. And it was basically Teddy Roosevelt and the progressive era that broke up a lot of these monopolistic practices that a lot of these companies were doing at that time, aka Standard Oil, Carnegie Steel, and a lot Because of the bailouts and a few things that woke up to try and say, hey, look, we've got to get back on the market. We've got to get some things done. And to this day, I still think it was very incredible that I was able to walk into the auto show last year and drive an all-electric car, drive a gas hybrid. And even today, just seeing what's happened in just the information revolution in less than 20 years of the development of the Internet is absolutely incredible. And I'm also believing that that same power to innovate is what's going to bring this country out of its present dilemma with energy. I'll speak on more of this next week. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Well, I will have to say this, Tim. Your reference to the web is, in important respects, relevant here, and, at least for at least two reasons. Number one, it is remarkable the age we live in in one, in, in one respect, and that is that you can go on the web and you can go to websites like the Archduber Report and read a post by him once a week and then read dozens and really hundreds of comments, and, and he responds to many, if not most, of the comments. You've got there a system of dialogue and scrutiny which can't be beaten. Now, that's number one. And number two, and I'll get back to this in a minute, number two, you can look on the web, you can go to places like Amazon, and look at products and customer reviews of the products, mm -hmm. which on occasion are, so to speak, priceless. The problem is that most Americans don't read Archdruid. You, even with all the work you've done in this, and I'm going to be buying your book, of course, for that price, mm -hmm. you didn't know who the Archdruid was. And yet, and, and there's other guys like him who I can rattle off here on the web, and some of them have, again, these threads of comments. 
which are just a gold mine of insight compared to what you're going to read or hear 99% of the time in the mainstream media. Now, maybe Charlie Rose is actually worth something, but it seems clear to me that 99 plus percent of them are worth nothing. And what, and they, and, the, and Charlie Rose, he was always, as I understand it, banished to the midnight hour or some such. You know, that they, he was relatively speaking out to pasture. Whereas the folks who get on TV in prime time, you know, day after day, week after week, etc., those folks understand f full well that there's only so far that they dare go in stepping out of line. And so, you know, the system is rigged. And I, you know, I'm washing my hands of any prospects to speak of that things are going to do anything other than get worse. And so, as I see my job is attempt to preserve some sort of heritage and build some sort of oasis of knowledge, if not wisdom, for future generations in what's liable to be a desert or an ocean of ignorance. Now, there's all sorts of things that one can do, besides you know, one can rattle off, I can rattle off other websites that are worth going to on various matters. Um, there's a dude named Fairfall, who, uh, F-E-R-F-A-L, and his title is Surviving in Argentina, the, the, the inflation there from 10 years ago, all right? And how you, all sorts of, again, comments from readers and so on, it's, it's a great resource. Um, there's another guy named Carl Denninger, and his outfit, his, his thrust is MarketTicker.org, but he has comments, he lost 50 or so pounds and how he did that, and he analyzes the, the things going on in the healthcare system and healthcare spending. And then you've got a certain Charles Hugh Smith. I could, he's another one worth mentioning. And then there's Gail the Actuary, okay, who analyzes all, so she's got all sorts of cool charts about oil production and consumption and the, the various different kinds of energy sources, all sorts of statistical type stuff. Maybe people don't like statistics, but too damn bad. There's seven billion people on this planet. A good three billion live, live, live in one quarter of Asia. They ain't got the farmland to feed all those mouths. So what are they going to do? Eventually maybe invade countries to get their food and their water and all the other stuff that they need. Yeah, how the hell? It'd be nice, Ed, if we could have seven billion people living like we live. I don't think there's enough stuff and enough farmland and this and that and water and so on for everybody to live source. like this. Seven billion people to live like this. I don't think we're going to make it. Uh, so you, you know, I'm making on certain assumptions and trying to make judgments as to get sort of how to build uh, on the micro level something which at least will be some sort of beacon for generations. And the Industrial Revolution, yeah, you can go on Amazon.com and you can look up reviews and you can see what people have to say about stuff like this. Now, I might have paid 15 bucks, 10 or 15 bucks for this thing. It's got a thermometer. No, maybe that won't last forever. It's got a compass. Maybe it'll last, that won't last forever. But it's got a whistle. <laughs> All right, I'll bet you that lasts for hundreds and maybe with, with luck, assuming nobody creams it thousands of years. And then and the you, garbage <laughs> dump. Well, whatever. And it's what I do, parenthetically, when Frank gets up here and speaks a lot, he starts out by talking about plastic shit. <laughs> well, I save plastic shit. Uh -huh. Whereas when I go to a restaurant, you know, there's those plastic things, I say them, someday somebody will store something on them. And here you can fold this thing out and there's, there's a, uh, uh, what you call it? Right, a magnifying glass. <laughs> 10 to 15 bucks. There you can make, you make wise decisions and you can actually keep some. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Anderson, and uh, my hobby is translating books. Uh, I take a book and uh, translate it, the essence of it down into a one-page cliff notes. I bought a couple of her books already because it looks like a, a fascinating book. And I think what I would say, I also, uh, I'm a volunteer coach at a middle school. I uh, work with 7th and 8th graders on science projects. Um, 
we teach seventh graders in order to solve any problem, you have to first correctly identify the problem. If you can't identify the problem, then you have no way of finding a solution. And uh, after you correctly identify the problem, the, the first step, of course, is facing the reality that you have a problem, rather than just living in a bubble of fantasy or ignorance. Uh, Phil, a guy named Phil Rockstra uh, published an article five years ago. I found it in the files. It's from one of the internet sites. He said, what we live, have in America is a, a Disneyland of militant ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> a Disneyland of militant ignorance. People are totally comfortable coming up to a podium like this and expressing some views that are just terrifyingly ignorant and completely out of touch with reality. You wonder how these people make it back and forth to work with a set of car keys and a driver's license. <laughs> so uh, on certain subjects, I, I, we never worry about getting stabbed in the back with a knife or a fork here. You know, we all we feel safe having dinner. Uh, we, 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 I like to think we have the same basic values. We respect each other. There's, as far as I know, there's never been any terrorists sitting in here waiting to stab somebody in the throat when nobody's working or set off a hand grenade or when nobody's looking. That doesn't happen here. We all have middle class values. What the problem is, we're on different spots of this, the learning spectrum, uh, what's become known as the Galileo Curve. Galileo was arrested and prosecuted and under arrest for the rest of his life because he was promoting the idea that the earth revolves around the sun and the authorities, the church, didn't want to hear it. Well, people came along behind him with telescopes and said, hey, he was right. <laughs> Today, you can't debate whether the earth is flat or round. Today, you, 25 years ago, you could get into a fist fight in a restaurant suggesting that somebody put out their cigarette or cigar. Some of you probably remember that. Yep. I, do. I do. Today, we move forward as a society. We're all on the same page. We accept smoke-free restaurants. Um, what's happened in America in the last decade is driven by the single biggest myth that's ever been created in modern times, and that is the myth that was sold to us by the media that we were attacked by a group of lucky Arabs on the morning of 9-11. Okay. Now that has been shown to be a total myth created and supported, promoted by the media. The media had the script on the morning of 9-11, and everything that's happened in America in the last decade especially the eight years of the most successful corporate criminal combine masquerading as a government, which was the Bush administration. Um, if we face that reality, that there is no international terrorist network waiting to stab us all in the back, we bring the troops home from everywhere. Quit pouring a trillion dollars a year down the military rat hole and start spending that money on American jobs of all kinds. Uh, Somebody just mentioned, you know, it's not commonly known in America that the world produces enough food to feed everybody. What we don't have, everybody in the world doesn't have enough money to buy that food at market prices because you have big piles of food rotting and they don't give it to people that don't have any money. If you think, think outside the box, I carry cards, incidentally, with uh, the portal websites on them. There's a handful of sites that you can go to that give you, um, it's like a doorway into the other world where all the blacked out news is. The mainstream press runs coordinated blackouts on certain subjects. Like 9-11, they promote the myth and they black out 500 scientists and experts of steel manufacturing companies saying steel doesn't melt. You get the myth and the blackout. So uh, on several different things, uh, if, if you just puncture the bubble of the myth, there's we have to start facing the reality that we've been shoveling money to rich criminals for the last 30 years or so, but at least the last, since 2000. We've been shoveling money to bankers, hedge fund managers, is what Jesus would have called the ultimate money changers. It's a racket. If we, if we, if we face this reality on a bunch of different subjects, things can get better very, very fast. One last thing I'll say, Germany is one country, somebody mentioned Germany is leading the way, they're showing what the energy future looks like. Solar panel. They put up enough solar panels on rooftops of buildings and houses to shut down 20 nuclear power plants. 
and uh, the new in, new home standards are coming out on January 1st this year. They're going to be mandating triple pane windows, better insulation. Houses without furnaces are going to be built all through America. Start, I've been talking about that for 25 years, but it sounds like science fiction. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's uh, 10, 20, Brown. You don't have to. Have, you know, we, we've got a. You can spare a minute. Thank you all. And if anybody wants a card with uh, the websites on, but you want to know where the real news is without learning about Lindsay Lohan's latest boyfriend, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> definition of it is excess and extravagant desires, which is, you know, I think fairly serviceable. But uh, we haven't really talked too much about that. I think we're going to solve the problems of extravagance is to curb these ideas these desires uh, for excess. Uh, we don't need all this stuff. I think one example of simplicity might be found in religious orders. Not just Catholic, but uh, those are the main ones. And uh, having seen a few myself, and I really, oh, that's cool. they're, they're not poverty. They're not practicing. They take vows of poverty, but it's not vows of grinding poverty. I mean, they're they just have a living quarters and. Food and so on. You know, it's, it's all pretty nice. In general rule. Not that there's anything extravagant about it. The reason Catholic schools are going down is because religious orders have not been able to attract members in recent years. Which means that basically there's no free teachers. We can try. So I think I think you know keep talking about yeah you always hear this thing about advertising Christ desires. I think John Kenneth Gilbert they said that, but I think there are. There are ways of uh, curbing desires that can make you more miserable and happy when when you're not satisfied, and eventually they won't be. But uh, we're in a definition of hell once that's. Or at least you come across a different definition of health. Good company. <coughs> well, heaven for atmosphere and hell for society. But anyway, it's uh, all these unrestrained desires that make you miserable. So. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm always impressed with people who um, actually have the nerve to come up here and give a presentation. I only did it once and I was exhausted for three days afterwards. <laughs> so, um, 
I guess uh, I, I think the main thing is, is that, I, that um, it kind of bugs me when people take a word, for example, like simplicity, and then use it in a different way, and then you're not ever quite sure about what they mean about it. And so um, I think that the book is, is a bit misnamed according to what was talked to about it tonight, or was it about what you said about it. So, uh, and I think the, that the idea of simplicity is very appealing because people's lives now are so, com that seem to be at this point so complex and it's because we have all this stuff. Um, there was a book uh, that was, uh, photographers went around the world and people took things out of their houses and were, was photographed in front of yeah. their houses and I know some people have seen that. And if you have somebody from Africa, you know, like have like four things, or you know, a chair and a table and a couple of pots. And um, at the uh, if you go to the museum, the field museum, and you uh, go into that um, exhibit uh, that starts out in um, the west coast of Africa in Senegal, and you go through and you see the Tuareg, which are uh, a uh, nomadic tribe, and they're, they're called the blue men of the desert because they dye their things very dark indigo, and then their skin gets dark, dyed from blue, literally from the um, clothes that they wear. And they have a tent, and the women can literally pack up the tent in one hour, everything they own, put it on the camel's back, and that's it. Now, I can't even pack a suitcase. <laughs> no. Anyway, so um, so I think that's part of the problem, and that you know we're so overwhelmed with stuff that it's hard to see. We're, we're so busy working through the stuff that we can't see our lives. Um, and so we look at something that says simplicity, and so we think that's very cool. And so there's this 300-page magazine that's been published every month to help you live a more simple life. I mean. <laughs> and so that's exactly the conundrum that we're faced with. So um, at any rate, um, and you know, this, I, I, I really want people not to be worried about their health and not to be worried about going, be going bankrupt and be living in safe uh, places that are safe, not just <laughs> for their health as well as just for personal security and um, but I but if I think if we return to uh, to people having as much money as they did the consumption levels are going to go up and um, I know I've mentioned in here before that I passed a bus that I saw several times had a big sign on it that said eat the world and that's exactly what we're doing with our levels of consumption our current level of consumption, even though it is reduced from previous years because of the economy, is still unsustainable. We are eating up the world's resources and they are not able to be replaced, and that is the definition of unsustainable. So basically, we're eating our way down the hill. And uh, there you are. Okay. Um, and then the other, uh, let's see here. I guess the other, the, I've, I've been reading a book by, that was written by Barbara Tuckman, which is very, she's, and this is a little bit off the subject, but this particular phrase may be something that we may learn to live with. Um, and one of the people, she ascribes the success of the American Revolution to the Dutch and their greed for trade. And um, one of the people, and then she goes into a little bit of history of the Netherlands, and that one of the people whose name was William the Silent, isn't that lovely? Um, no. <laughs> his, um, one of the things that he said, because he was in the middle, he was able to unite the, the, the various city-states that were part of, of Holland at the time, to actually throw off, off the oppression of the Spanish that had had them under their control for many years and done really horrible things to them. But the states were not ever able to, these little principalities were not ever able to unite because they had all these diverse, they wanted to do this, that, or the other thing and they, they never could get together. And he was finally able to bring them together. And so of course, it's about at one point he was assassinated by England. 
Um, but his um, saying was, you do not need hope in order to persevere. And I think that's a very profound thing to say. And I also am afraid that that is going to be one of my beacons in the future. <laughs> You get the last word. You get the last word, Sue. Yeah, go ahead. The first salute. No, she's not. Sorry. Speaker gets the last word. Well, it's been wonderful attending tonight, and I have to say I'm going to come back because I can find a lot of uh, good thinking going on here, and I think it's just got a great spirit. I mean, it's kind of, uh, you know. Got your eccentric types. And you got your, you know, <laughs> I know. Well, you know. I mean, so I fit in. That's why I like it. What can I say? So it's been a pleasure here tonight. Thank you. Nice to get to know all of you. I wish I had more time to get to know all of you individually. Down the road we will, right? So, um, and I would just like to say my book is available on Amazon. Um, and so, uh, and if you purchase books on Amazon, ever you can always do a review of it too. So, and I really haven't even checked recently to see what's been happening. So I, you know, I mean, I've got all positive reviews, so I'm, I'm happy. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.